chilling tales for dark nights. Remembering that time is hard. But I think it's important. So you can understand. Unfortunately, recalling those events is something I do quite often. My therapist said the next step in the healing process was to address my memories of that time. And to put the past to rest. I'll try anything she suggests at this point. Because I feel like I'm starting to lose it. And going back 17 years ago now, I just lost a high paying job in the city and made redundant after a company merger. Everything got messy at the business, and the rug got pulled out from underneath me pretty swiftly. I wasn't even entitled to severance pay from those crooks. The worst of it was that my line of work was fairly specialist. It would mean having to move and, and quickly, while I still had the majority of my last paycheck in my current account. Rachel, the kids, and I were living in a respectable apartment at the time. And staying anywhere within 20 miles of the city would be impossible on the meager savings I'd scraped together. And while I searched the industry magazines for openings, we'd have to move back out into the sticks. I felt like defeat, if I'm honest. Breaking it to the kids was the hardest part. And Philip was eight and, and finally become established at school. He'd become a mischievous little chatterbox, talkative and outgoing. I was now taking that all away from him. He'd be starting from scratch. At least Sarah, our youngest, had only just started school and didn't feel as bad. I figured at that age she'd be able to manage fairly well. Everything was sunny in her world and I just kind of hoped it would remain so. Philip, though, he... It felt like this could really stun his development for a spell. I simply hoped it wouldn't be for long, and given time, we'd be back in the bustle of a big city again. And the day we moved out of that apartment, I kept out one box in particular. I found a relic of my twenties while clearing out. A battered old tape deck Walkman. I basked in the glow on Philip's face when I presented it to him before saying farewell to our place. He'd been overjoyed. I dug out a small pair of travel headphones and he'd spent that long drive listening to some mixtapes from my college days that had inexplicably moved with me every time since Hall's. Every so often, presumably, a song ended. He would mutter to himself, introducing the next track from the hand-scrawled notes inside the cases as if he were a DJ. To see those bright imaginative sparks on what was a dull, exhausting pilgrimage back to the sparse wooded neighborhood of my youth. It gave me a little hope for our new life, and my old one. Hours of driving later, stopping only for a brief roadside meal, I pulled into a motel. The children were both in that blessed kind of sleep where they can be carried and changed with very little opposition and were soon settled. The following day I collected keys for our new lodgings, roughly 30 minutes away in the small mining town where I'd attended school. The memories of the place were far from ideal, perpetually drizzled in gloom. The local kids had always been contemptible. 
in the kind of town where there's no aspiration higher than doing the same damn thing your parents did, and blatant nepotism guaranteed you a place in said profession. As such, school was a complete waste of time, because it couldn't factor less in students' futures if it tried. And everyone knew it, from principal to pupil. The thought of Philip having to go to the same school I had struggled through was nerve-wracking. I remembered how abrasive and hearty the kids in my school years had been, especially the out-of-towners. Thankfully, it was the beginning of the summer holidays, and so there were a few weeks before he'd have to face that. The only problem being, those weeks would be largely spent in little social isolation. Fortunately, it was with great appreciation of the Walkman that my fears were again abated. As our first few days in the new place passed by, Philip, still enraptured by the impromptu present, was in his element. He spent both boarding and afternoon exploring the grounds and strictly no further, as his mother had decreed, tape player clipped to a belt hook on his jeans. I figured the Walkman helped with his loneliness. There was something tangible from the city now long left behind. It was noise and chatter in a battery-powered box. A talisman in the quiet of a dead-end town. About a week later, exasperated at another fruitless day of phone calls, I sat in the lounge long after the children had been sent off to bed. Against my better judgment, I was nursing a double whiskey. And as I sat in a low light, my thoughts turned to the old tapes I had given to Philip. It felt good to know that I'd helped my son acclimatize to this place just a little. It also gave me an idea. The next morning, while running an errand, I stopped by a second-hand hardware store. Armed with some spare cash, I'd scraped together. Clutching my spur-of-the-moment gifts, I returned home and sneaked into Philip's room while he was helping Sarah with her counting in the kitchen. And there I left a fresh packet of five blank tapes, and a small analog microphone. It was the size of a cigar, with a curly wire that could plug into the tape deck's input and Philip could use to capture his voice. As I left the room, I wondered if I was spoiling him. But my bones felt good about it. None of it had cost much, and it was getting him through a rough patch. Anything to make the transition easier. As planned, Philip was an explosion of energy, nattering for hours into the thing as he frequented the edge of the nearby woods. Every waking moment, he was working on a sketch or a monologue, even bothering me and Rachel for interviews at the breakfast table, and hours in his room after dark where he'd tape songs from the radio onto his Walkman. Days went by as the town's ecosystem did its best impression of summer conditions. I was temping at a local advertisement agency doing crap work for crap money, but it kept us in groceries while I looked for better opportunities elsewhere. Rachel fielded the kids. Well, Sarah. Philip was usually not far out of sight, though, climbing trees and chatting away into the curly mic, interviewing birds. And because he had excelled despite our fears of the relocation, he was left more and more to his own devices. Of course, I had no reason to doubt it at that point. And on the Friday night, through a combination of money worries and the underlying stress of the new job, I had a spat with Rachel. And unfortunately, I've always been one to wallow in my own self-pity, and as such, I began doing so with that increasingly familiar whiskey in hand. After a while in the dark, I started to muse on what have actually made me happy these days. And the children were the obvious answer. I went to their rooms to watch them sleep for a while. So peaceful and serene. Kids can be so unknowing of the true chaos around them, I guess. As I was about to leave Philip's room, I cast my eyes over his desk and smiled. My first genuine smile for what could have been weeks at that point. And one of the tapes wasn't blank anymore. The inlay was covered in the just legible scrawl of my boy. 
and I caught the title on the spine. Radio Phil. I had to stifle a chuckle. Rachel couldn't stand him being called Phil. And so I had to uphold this frankly petty rule when, truth be told, I didn't mind Phil at all. The little scamp was rebelling with his own pirate radio. The pride beamed out of me. I leaned forward gently and took the tape, heading back downstairs and into the lounge, which housed a retro-styled stereo system built into a wall cabinet. Pretty obsolete and glaringly 80s, I could understand why the previous occupants hadn't bothered to take it with them, but it would suit my needs fine. A radio film was certainly an interesting and eclectic show. It consisted of tracks taped from the radio with announcements, interviews, and skits by my Phil himself. I tried not to guffaw out loud as I heard Rachel's early morning voice answering inane questions in a section Phil had dubbed Sunny Side Schmuck, where the yoke was on us, the parents. A few songs, then a tongue twister challenge leaving Phil in hysterics and his own slurring of the evergreen favorite. She sells seashells. And the whole tape was an unbridled joy of anarchic, childish energy. Well, almost. Throughout the show, Phil had been drumming up the finale in his own silly style, but when I finally got to the end, the segment felt kind of off. In all the other interviews on Radio Phil, there was either a live participant such as Sarah or Rachel or Phil himself would step in and play the part of the interviewee alongside his DJ persona. As Phil announced the last interviewee, the boy in the well, I wondered if it were a little in poor taste. The segment began with Phil posing unremarkable questions to his interviewee, the boy in the well, but where he would perhaps have pretended to be the boy, he simply said nothing. Instead, there was silence, save for the whirring of the tape playback and a slight static rasp here and there. Phil would ask another question. After a while, and again, he was met with a large gap of silence. I wound it back a minute or so and listened intently for perhaps something I was missing. So this is Phil from Radio Phil. He began in his chirpy, upbeat DJ voice. And we're talking live with the boy in the well. And ever so sorry to hear about all this. Can you tell us what happened? The whir of the tape. The small rasps of intermittent static. Why on earth would you do that? Came Phil's response to the pause. Twenty seconds or so of the boy in the well saying nothing. You found it eventually? Phil questioned once more. Found what? I thought. Even by Phil's imaginative standards, this was somewhat bizarre. You couldn't get out again? Fourteen seconds of playback. I couldn't help but count. Each second seemed to spiral on for longer than the next, and a slightly nauseous feeling began to creep in. The whiskey had been a bad choice, as it often was. Think your dad knows where you are. Silence. Worrying. Static. I killed the tape. The click from the stop button seemed to echo into the darkness of the lounge for far longer than I found comfortable. I'd had enough of radio fill for a while and had reason to believe that perhaps my son wasn't adjusting as well in the cross-country move as I'd hoped. Of course it was to be expected. I had latched on to his positivity as it was something that made me feel better. Instead of looking deeper. 
I rewound the tape to the beginning and pocketed it for now. Later, after Rachel had granted me permission back to the marriage bed and our spat was over, I lay awake worrying about my son in the dark again. The amateur psychologist in me suggested that perhaps the boy in the well was his attempt at an imaginary friend of sorts, a proxy Phil. Maybe it was the act of talking aloud that helped him address these fears within himself. But then doubt and instinct crept under my skin like cold, clammy hands, choking out my carefully crafted facade of logic. It had been off. I wondered perhaps if Phil had come across something in his journeys in the surrounding area that he couldn't handle, that he was forced to compartmentalize in the form of this boy in the well. The thought that would finally usher in the embrace of sleep was the promise I made to myself to spend time with Phil the following day. I wasn't working, so I would be Radio Phil's co-anchor instead and not leaving him to his own devices any longer. I'd set my own mind at ease. Of course, by the time I was awoken in the morning by a sobbing, trembling Rachel, who could not find our boy anywhere, my worst fears were a reality. By the evening of the Sunday, they were confirmed by the Extremely polite and very consoling police officers who had found a body matching our description. They had spent the whole weekend combing the surrounding area and in dense woodland a mile or so away had found his broken frame lying at the bottom of a well. They said that he had Probably hit the sides on the way down, knocking himself out and drowning fairly quickly. Although that was supposed to be a relief, as opposed to imagining him bobbing there in agony, it brought little comfort. I'll never forget what they said. Uh, that happens occasionally everywhere. Children go missing, stray into long forgotten mine shafts and over chasms, down wells and into bodies of water. My Phil was one of those children now, lost to the underground. They saw no reason to investigate further, and I was thankful for that. The only way I could conceive the hell I felt being worse somehow was if Rachel or I were implicated. The truth burned a hole in my heart. Phil must have found this well. That's where the fascination with it must have started. Drawn to the concept of kids falling down wells, it had manifested itself in the only private journal my son had ever composed. Radio Phil. Maybe he had fallen in while leaning that tiny microphone over the edge to conduct another interview. Or perhaps even wondered if we would Pay more attention to him if he became the boy in the well. Despair became my Iron Maiden and I doubted I would ever be free of it. Time passed. We breathed, ate, and slept despite that niggling feeling that everything would be easier if I ended it all. Even whiskey couldn't help. It became an hourly battle against myself to not attempt to go back to the old safety blanket of self-indulgent pity. I was aware that Rachel and Sarah needed me more than I needed or could feasibly allow myself to slip away. 
In fact, it was Sarah I was most concerned with, as death is a difficult concept for children to fully grab hold of. She started exhibiting denial behaviors, talking aloud to the TV as if she were communicating with someone, presumably Phil. After a few days, there must have been scheduled maintenance work on the area's broadcasting aerials because our TV and radio were picking up static rasping that made it impossible for me to escape into my shows and movies. I would try to follow the stories, but the raspy static reminded me all too easily of the all but silence of the boy in the well's responses on Radio Phil. Had my poor boy decided on such a fate? Or was it at least as I'd hoped? A tragic accident. My mind was a daily war between consoling and torturing myself. The only thing that helped me focus in those dark days was what happened next. Sarah, our four-year-old crayon-loving imp, was still talking to the TV. It bothered me. But Rachel suggested we be patient with her, and if not indulge her in this coping mechanism, at least allow it. So I would be scanning the industry papers I had subscribed to for jobs. While in the far end of the room, I could hear some kind of Disney film blaring. Every few seconds, the picture was glitching up slightly and the static rasps fuzzed over the existing dialogue. I tried to push the thoughts of Radio Phil from my mind and succeeded slightly. The paper. I was concentrating on the paper. But occasionally, usually after one of these bursts of signal interference from the maintenance works, Sarah would continue playing with her toys, but produce a statement or a question that seemed at odds with her make-believe. Mommy would say no. She would say. Then some talk of a dinosaur coming to tea. Then... But why? In a whiny voice. I was ready to return my full attention to the paper when she looked directly at the TV and said, Are you sure I have to? Something was wrong. My gut knew it. Were both my children losing it because of this move? My heart and stomach lurched as I thought of Phil. A prophesied boy in the well. For a few moments, I stabbed at myself with the rusted shards of self-damnation. I thought of whiskey. I thought of the city and our old apartment. I shut my eyes fiercely as the tears swelled. I wished with all my being that we could go back. My eyes shot open when I heard Rachel scream from upstairs. Sarah's name, and then mine. I threw down the paper to be greeted with an empty room, and my puzzled mind grabbed a hold of the crisis that now demanded my urgency. Rachel was upstairs screaming from what sounded like the master bedroom. I recalled the window to that room from memory. It faced the northwest of the grounds, the woodlands. My reflexes kicked in now they had a plan of action, and I flew from the lounge to the kitchen and then out the side door. A glimpse of Sarah's red coat at the tree line. She had a head start. But I was faster. And by the time I'd caught up to her, my heart sank. She was in floods of tears, wearing Phil's Walkman and travel headphones. I picked her up from behind and pulled her close to my chest. As I turned back to the house, I saw Rachel running across the lawn towards the wooden fence I'd vaulted with adrenaline, which Sarah had toddled beneath moments before. Sarah's inconsolable sobbing was punctuated only by cries for her mother. And so into the warm embrace of Rachel's arms she went. Hours afterward, I found myself smashing the Walkman to pieces. 
I took the fragments of the damn thing, all of my mixtapes, the microphone, and the blanks to the yard, incinerated them in a bonfire. I nursed a whiskey while I watched. Probably a bad choice. But perhaps I'd try to make it the last one. And after drinking a toast to the funeral pyre of my dead son's tape deck, I resolved to try and give up using alcohol as my crutch. I kept the radio fill tape, though, long after the crushing business of laying him to rest. The move back to my parents' house, and then four months later, the start of a new job in a different city. I would always be able to hear his voice. To revel in the childish stupidity of sunny side schmuck. The tape now became my talisman against a future without him in it. I felt a bittersweet peace whenever I pressed play. And truth be told, I could never listen to the finale again. It would have been too painful to hear the mention of the boy in the well. I'd always cut it off at the track before and then rewind it for the next time I needed to smile. Eventually, I had to stop listening to the tape for fear of wearing it to pieces. And it made its way to Phil's box in the attic, where we kept all the things that had been his. I had purposefully marked the site as Phil's box. And I was glad that Rachel never attempted to correct the name to Philip. My therapist says I shouldn't blame myself. Then it's very hard to pick up on behaviors and traits in children. And even if Phil had wanted to throw himself into the well, there's precious little he did or said that could have helped me know beforehand. In fact, if I hadn't listened to Radio Phil that night, I... I'd have no reason at all to believe it was anything other than a tragic accident. But still, this, this is the facade of logic, which will never beat that niggling feeling in my gut that chooses to surface late at night. Phil knew about the well. He was curious about it, and it preyed on his mind. I could assume this much. He must have visited it at least once. Sarah was headed in that exact same direction when she took off, but she had definitely not visited it at all. Rachel had been glued to her all summer. How had she known where to go? It was the one question I couldn't answer. Could Phil have mentioned the well to Sarah? It was possible, sure, but could a four-year-old remember complex directions at all, let alone for a well a mile or more away? I doubted it, and it was enough doubt to keep my stomach turning into the small hours. This question has been eating away at me for a, a few years now, and I'm wondering if I'm becoming obsessed by it. Sarah stopped by a few days ago for Father's Day. She's becoming a beautiful young woman, still sunny and determined to make waves in the design world. I couldn't be prouder. All those crayons paid off. After the events of that summer so long ago, we ensured she was checked over by a number of professionals and received sufficient support. She didn't seem to remember much about it and and I took that as a blessing. Unwrapping my present a few hours later, I found she bought me one of those tape decks that comes with a USB connection so you can transfer content from old audio tapes to the computer. The note inside was brief, 
but heartfelt. Dad, I know it's been a long time since you tuned in. Maybe it would help. Radio Phil, of course. It had been a few years since the last time. And through the little tool she'd bought me, I could digitize Radio Phil. And then it wouldn't matter if the tape fell to pieces due to the amount of times it had been played. She'd probably seen this obsession growing within me and the lack of sleep that must obviously show under my eyes. I went up to Phil's box in the attic and enjoyed the pictures, toys, and cards that were housed safe within. It was always like an old reunion with friends you had never forgotten, but may not have spoken to in years. And here was Thunderbird number three. Miscellaneous trading cards. A few marbles. And a sketch of our old apartment in the city. I greeted all these things with the usual combination of pleasure and pain. Rediscovery and loss. I found what I was looking for. The tape. Still as I had remembered it. A significant part of me wishes now that it had not escaped the bonfire. Perhaps ignorance can be bliss given the right circumstances. I listened with great appreciation as I heard those tracks of my youth. Heard Sunny side schmuck with the Rachel I had married. Not the tired, beaten Rachel. I now knew and continually struggled to converse with. The tongue twisters and Phil's addictive laughter managed to soothe away some of the sadness that now always sits at my core. I instinctively cut off the last chorus of the final song and pressed stop, but my finger hovered over the tape controls for a while. The tape could be where that last haunting interview would remain forever. Minutes burned away as I debated if I could consign the boy in the well to oblivion. Or if I should digitize it all the same. Despite the bitter memories I had connected to it, it was a part of Phil. I couldn't knowingly destroy forever a part of Phil. There are precious few left in the world as it is. So I continued in the conversion process, listening apprehensively to the tape as I continued the playback, and it whirred its contents into the PC. So this is Phil from Radio Phil. He began in his chirpy, upbeat DJ voice. And we're talking live with the boy in the well. I'm ever so sorry to hear about all this. Can you tell us what happened? The whir of the tape. The small rasps of intermittent static. But then a voice. Indistinct and ethereal. It slowly and solemnly replied to Phil's question. Jump down the well. Why on earth would you do that? Came Phil's response to the pause. Where I would expect 20 seconds or so of the boy in the well saying nothing. Instead, he finally spoke. It became a struggle to hear the voice over the involuntary shaking I was now experiencing. The voice sounded that of an adolescent, at least... Yet the language seemed that of a child. The boy in the well existed. And his somber tones injected ice into my veins. I didn't have a choice. Came the reply. I felt something pulling me towards the well. 
My stomach was performing acrobatics of a wretched kind. Clear as day I could hear these words, and yet they had not been there on the eve of Phil's disappearance. Was I finally losing it completely? A question I still cannot answer either way. Phil questioned once more. In the vague, fuzzy corners of my memory, I recalled a Mrs. Hopkins. You couldn't get out again? A pause. And then... I'm still here. My breath caught my chest and my fingers, now white-knuckled, gripped the arms of my chair. Knows where you are. Silence. Whirring. Static. Then the somehow adolescent voice of my dead child, Philip, oozed into my ears. Tears swelled in my eyes, and I wasn't sure if I could take much more. My heart felt contorted and sore, pulverized by revelations that answered my questions in such a way that I wished I had never asked them. I listened to my son in fevered anguish, holding on his every word. I was listening to the grand finale of Radio Phil, <laughs> the boy in the well, talking to me and me only. Dad, I, Dad, I, I, want, you, I want you to know that the tape made a strange screeching noise with the player. And I looked down to see the magnetic tape inside the cassette catch and then snap. A very faint smell of burnt plastic escaped the thing. The tape would never play again. I couldn't help but think 
Something deep in the shadows had pulled the plug on his signal. And I wept. Until my tired eyes went a hazy pink. And I poured a whiskey. <laughs> and I threw it away. That was a few hours ago. I'm not sure if I'm insane. Part of me feels that if you suspect you might be, you can't truly be. Of course, this could be my familiar friend, the logical facade, trying to keep me grounded. So I leave it to you. Please. Listen to this sound file I'm attaching here. Listen to Radio Phil. And see if you can hear the boy in the well. Otherwise, as I suspect, the last interview will be silent. And I have truly lost my mind to grief.